serving as Senior Vice President here at the Family Research Council. On behalf of our President Tony Perkins and all of us here at FRC, thanks for joining us for this important lecture on American cultural imperialism. Sadly, that's a topic that many of us hoped our country would never even have to address, but today we do, and we have a very distinguished lecturer to enable us to understand it better. For those of you joining us online, welcome. We trust that the uh, reception you're getting online is uh, going well, and this webcast will be available online uh, by late this afternoon or early tomorrow morning for those who might be unable to view it right now. The Obama administration has engaged in an aggressive and insistent effort to force recipients of American foreign aid to accept the President's pro-homosexuality agenda. This has gone even to the point of demanding that African nations change their laws against same-sex intimacy and those barring same-sex marriage or risk losing U.S. assistance and even military support in um, fighting terrorist organizations. President Obama plans a trip to Kenya recently, or in the last few days actually, the Kenyan Evangelical Council of 700 pastors has issued a public statement to the President calling on him not to demand that Kenya in, uh, change its laws concerning homosexuality. This is obviously deeply troubling and is emblematic of the kind of aggressive pressure being faced by nations in the developing world. As with so many areas, other areas of President Obama's priorities, this initiative also pushes the statutory authority of the presidency past the breaking point. Today we're honored to welcome Dr. John Eastman as he examines the ways in which our foreign policy has compromised a, or has promoted rather a radical agenda on marriage and sexuality and compromised American national interests in doing so. Dr. John Eastman is the Henry Salvatore Professor of Law and Community Service at Chapman University, Fowler School of Law in California, and also served as the school's dean from 2000 seven through 2010 when he stepped down to pursue a bid for California Attorney General. He is the founding director of the, of the Constitutional Jurisprudence Clinic, a public interest law firm affiliated with the Claremont Institute. And as I mentioned to him prior to the lecture, in 1996 I had the privilege of uh, serving in the introductory class of the Lincoln Fellowship with Claremont. My colleague Kathy Roos was in the class I believe following me. She went on to uh, serve as the chief counsel for the House Judiciary Subcommittee on the Constitution. So we have a great affiliation and affection for Claremont. Dr. Eastman is involved in many good things, including chairman of the board of the National Organization for Marriage. He has been involved in more than 60 Supreme Court cases. He earned his JD from the University of Chicago School of Law, his PhD and MA from Claremont Graduate School, and his undergraduate degree at the University of Dallas. He's also been um, a senior, or rather, um, he practiced in the national law firm of Kirkland and Ellis and has a prestigious background as a constitutional authority and practitioner. So it's an honor and a pleasure uh, to ask you to join me in welcoming Dr. John Eastman. Thank you all. It's a real pleasure to be here and to talk about uh, an issue that uh, until relatively recently had been flying under my radar and I suspect many of your radars as well. Uh, and yet it's very important. I'm going to begin though with a little bit of a preview um, and maybe a sliver of optimism uh, on the upcoming Supreme Court decision. Now I, uh, I want you to note that I'm not rushing off to Las Vegas to lay bets down on these things. I'm just going to give you some grounds for optimism uh, maybe more optimism than most other people in this town have, or certainly on the East Coast. So um, uh, where are we in the Supreme Court? Well, we know uh, two years ago the Supreme Court struck down the provision of the Federal Defense of Marriage Act. Uh, Justice Kennedy, writing the opinion, did so largely on federalism grounds, although he has a caveat at the end of that whole discussion. I'm not saying this is required by federalism, but, we, but, he, but, but he builds the argument around that federalism thing. Uh, the two dis chief dissenters, Just Chief Justice Roberts, focused on federalism and said, therefore, states that choose to retain man-woman marriage by the same federalism rationale should be able to do so. Justice Scalia said in dissent, though, um, he described his court's uh, pretense that today's prohibition of laws excluding uh, same-sex marriage uh, is 
confined to the federal government, leaving for the next round. We all know the language, the other shoe to drop, uh, maybe next term. Well, we're now on that another shoe dropping. And what's happened since? Well, most lower federal courts uh, took Justice Scalia's predictions uh, rather than Chief Justice Roberts and followed uh, suit, except for the Sixth Circuit. Uh, and that's the case that's up there in the Supreme Court right now. It was argued, as all of you, I'm sure, know, in April, and it'll be decided probably the last day of June, maybe the first of July. All right, so was Scalia right or not? So here are five reasons why I'm cautiously optimistic. Uh, uh, about the, that decision. First, the Supreme Court already decided this issue 40 years ago. Identical claims, due process and equal protection claims, were resolved in a summary disposition by the court in Baker versus Nelson. That has precedential value that all the lower courts have been ignoring at their peril. Now, here's what the case, uh, the, the Supreme Court case law says about the precedential value and binding authority of even summary dispositions. Um, the lower courts are bound by them until this court uh, says that they are not. Right? You won't see that language when all the lower courts say, well, we don't have to comply with, with uh, Baker because subsequent developments have undermined it. Well, the very next sentence in Hicks that says subsequent developments says this, but those subsequent developments say that we may not be bound by it, but the lower courts are. Um, and if that wasn't clear, another 1989 case, if a precedent of this court has direct application in a case, yet appears to rest on reasons rejected in some other line of decisions, the Court of Appeals should follow the case it directly controls, leaving to this court the prerogative of overruling its own decisions. Now, that argument had much greater uh, uh, validity in the lower courts because, uh, as you see on both of them, until this court informs them they're no longer bound by it or leaving this court the prerogative, but it nevertheless is binding precedent. Uh, it's certainly binding on the lower courts, and it ought to have some precedential weight in the Supreme Court as well. Okay, reason number two. Justice Kennedy's own opinion in the Windsor case. Uh, this proposition is how he opens the opinion. For marriage between a man and a woman no doubt had been thought of by most people as essential to the very definition of the term and to its role and function throughout the history of civilization. That's a pretty good statement of what marriage is about. And he never comes back around to challenge that opening uh, assertion of what the issue is about. Um, and then he focuses on federalism, as I said. The states possess full power over the subject of marriage and divorce. The Constitution delegates no authority to the government of the United States on that subject. Right? That's pretty solid understanding of the differential uh, roles of the federal and the state governments on this question. The entire subject of domestic relations of husband and wife, parent and child, belongs to the laws of the states and not to the laws of the United States. Well, if he follows that reasoning, except for that little caveat that he gave at the end of it, if he follows that reasoning, if New York wants to experiment with a redefinition of marriage, uh, under that reasoning, the federal government ought to recognize it. But if Alabama chooses not to experiment with such a radical redefinition of marriage, the federal government, including the federal courts, ought to respect that decision as well. Uh, reason number three, and this is kind of a little bit of an inside baseball reason, um, but let me lay it out. Here was the voting lineup in the Hollingsworth versus Perry case. This is where the precise issue, can states have laws defining marriages between a man and a woman, uh, the precise issue that came up to the court. And in, in the course of that decision, the Supreme Court said the proponents of the initiative had no legal standing to bring the appeal when the attorney general who won the election that I tried to win uh, decided not to bring the appeal. Um, but look at the lineup here. This is an odd lineup for anybody that follows the court well. The conservatives, Roberts and Scalia, their views on standing are pretty stingy. Uh, so it's no surprise to see them holding that the proponents of the initiative had no legal standing. But Justice Ginsburg and Breyer and Kagan if anybody knows their views on standing, I mean, they, they'll give standing to a deck of cards if they think it'll advance something. So why, why did they not vote to confer standing here? Because any one of them recognizing standing in line with their normal views on standing would have given Justice Kennedy the five votes to get beyond that jurisdictional question and get to the merits. Why do you think those three, not one of them, wanted to do that? 
Is it because they know that Justice Kennedy isn't prepared to rule that on the merits? Or at least that they're so, it's such an open issue in their mind that they weren't confident of where his vote was? That's the only way I can explain this lineup. Uh, and it's, uh, that's, I think, one of the, mo mo the most interesting. I know it's kind of like um, uh, those old uh, Politburo specialists, the uh, Sovietologists, that would see who was standing next to whom in a Politburo formal photograph to try and predict who was up on power and down on power. But I think this is very significant, that not one of them was willing to cast the vote to give standing, which would have allowed Justice Kennedy then to reach the merits decision. All right, reason number four. Justice Kennedy's opinion, and, she, and I keep focusing on Kennedy because I think most people think he's a swing vote. Uh, if he goes with Ginsburg and Kagan, it's 5-4, possibly 6-3, although I doubt it, to mandate same-sex marriage across the country. If he stays with the conservatives, it's 5-4 to allow states to continue to recognize a long-standing definition of marriage. So Kennedy's vote is critical. Here's what he said in another controversial case last year. Schutte, uh, the dealing with the uh, Michigan Affirmative Action uh, Prohibition, uh, state constitutional amendment. And here's the language, and very hard-hitting language. The respondents in this case insist that a difficult question of public policy must be taken from the reach of the voters. That is inconsistent with the underlying premises of a responsible, functioning democracy. It is demeaning. See, Justice Kennedy's language in Windsor about how not recognizing same-sex marriage is demeaning, Here's, he's using the same language to describe taking the issue away from the voters, a controversial social issue. It is demeaning to the democratic process to presume that the voters are not capable of deciding an issue of this sensitivity on decent and rational grounds. Freedom embraces the right, indeed the duty, to engage in a rational civic discourse to determine how best to form a consensus to shape the destiny of the nation and its people. First Amendment dynamics would be disturbed if this court were to say that the question here at issue is beyond the capacity of the voters to debate and then to determine. It's no accident we filed a brief in this case pointing out that more than 50 million Americans over the last 10 years have voted to reaffirm the man-woman definition of marriage compa compared to about 32 million that voted the other direction. That's, that's over 60 percent to 39 percent. That's a landslide in American politics. This isn't some outlier state continuing to adhere to an old view. This is the overwhelming majority of Americans who have demonstrated their position by votes. And the final reason, the map, I'll call it. Here's the map of states that have man-woman marriage laws on the books, either in statute or constitutional provision, all of those in green. Now, that's not the map that you hear about uh, in the New York Times and the Washington Post. Here's the one you hear about. This is the human rights campaign map. These are the states in which same-sex marriage is legal. And, it, you know, it's complete opposite. Uh, uh, the, the overwhelming number of states are legal. But let's unpack that map and find out what's really going on. Only three states, by vote of the people, have redefined marriage. Only eight more by their legislatures have done it by, by legislative enactment. And in some of those, like New York, the legislators who switched their vote did so at their own peril because as a result of that shift in vote, they lost their next elections, all right? All the rest of these states that have same-sex marriage legal right now have had it imposed on them by the courts, right? And so if we're looking about where the American people on this question is, that's a pretty profound thing. What are the likely harms? Well, redefining marriage will weaken the institution, resulting in fewer marriages in all likelihood. We've already seen it happening in Massachusetts. We saw it happening uh, in, the, in the one nation that was even ahead of that in the Netherlands. Uh, about 15 percent greater than the decline in marriage in the adjoining European nations that were similar to them. Decline in the U.S. states that have adopted same-sex marriage between 3 and 9 percent. Above, this is at a time when, on average, uh, marriage rates have kind of stabilized in the United States. So this is pretty profound. Children do best, we know, when they're raised by their biological parents in a married relationship. And so if I decline the number of heterosexuals entering into that relationship, I put a lot of kids at risk for not having that connection with their biological parents. Um, serious... 
uh, developmental psychological problems, it's more than double when you have only one biological parent in the household. That is true by definition for same-sex couples. By the way, this is not a commentary on same-sex parenting because th it's also true for heterosexual couples where one of them is not biological. It's more a question of that very important biological kinship tie uh, that, that flows from the institution. All right. Um, this is what the most comprehensive study on this uh, showed, just published last year. For every measure of child emotional difficulty, children with same-sex parents are observed to have higher levels of emotional and behavioral distress than do children with opposite-sex couples. It's more than uh, twice the rate of those problems. It shifts our institution of marriage from child-centered to adult-centered and will delink the institution from children. Uh, many on the other side uh, praise this as a benefit <laughs> rather than a collateral harm on what they're seeking to do. Um, Bill Eskridge, gay experience with families we, ch we choose, that's our new phrase, delinks family from gender, blood, and kinship. So you don't have to take my word that this is what it's going to do. Gay families of choice are relatively ungendered, raise children that are biologically unrelated to one or both parents, and often form no more than a shadowy connection between the larger kinship groups. If we think those larger kinship groups uh, have any benefit to society at all, and you know, you go back to the great political philosophers all the way to Aristotle, the, the, the founding block, the core of good government is that family unit and the kinship groups that flow from it. Uh, the notion that this isn't going to have any consequence at all on society is just preposterous. All right, so, uh, It'll be particularly severe for poor women and children. Um, by making fathers optional in the marriage definition, we're likely to see a greater number of children raised uh, without their fathers. And the weight of scientific evidence pretty de clearly demonstrates that you do that, you, you increase the cycle of poverty that flows uh, from that. Higher rates of dropout, teenage pregnancy, criminal delinquency, et cetera, uh, that flow from fatherless households. This is, the, this is the brave new world we're being asked to embrace with enthusiasm. Okay, now, why does this U U.S., what happens here, matter? If the Supreme Court does mandate same-sex marriage across the country, why does it matter on the international stage? And this is going to now lead me to the, to the main thing advertised for this talk. Well, the one is our cultural influence is a juggernaut. Hollywood reaches its tentacles the world over, and the rest of the world looks to us for good or ill. Uh, you've got Disneyland outside of Paris. You've got McDonald's in Moscow. Uh, our cultural influence is profound. But, but more troubling to me is the cultural imperialism that we've started to see crop up. So here's um, uh, Secretary of State John Kerry a year ago, a year and a half ago almost now. The United States is deeply concerned by Nigeria's enactment of the Same-Sex Marriage Prohibition Act. Now, the president of Nigeria responded to that statement in rather diplomatic terms. You read between the lines of what he said. He was concerned about John Kerry expressing concern about what they were doing. Uh, uh, but, but the archbishop there was a little less diplomatic. The United States actually said it would help Nigeria with Boko Haram only if we modify our laws concerning homosexuality, family planning, and birth control, said Bishop Emmanuel Beheho uh, a month after Kerry's talk. That's pretty stark. That we would threaten to cut off military exercises to stop a terrorist organization taking root in Nigeria because this administration didn't like what Nigeria was doing within its own domestic policy on the question of homosexual conduct is preposterous. What's the development of this policy? It dates back to a President Obama speech in the UN in September of 2011. Just thrown in, just a little line, the speech was not about this topic, but one line gets into the speech. No country should deny people their rights because of who they love, which is why we must stand up for the rights of gays and lesbians everywhere. That was the sum total of this line in the speech. But how did that then develop into a new policy? Not by any act of Congress, not by any formal change, but kind of sub rosa. So December of 2011, the president issues a memorandum. The international initiatives to advance the human rights of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender persons. Uh, he expressed concern about laws that criminalize LGBT status, emphasis on the uh, word status there. Note how that plays out when it actually gets implemented, which I'll go over in a minute. There were beatings of citizens for uh, joining peaceful parades, killing women and children. Anybody in this room support either of those things? No, I didn't think so. All right. 
Um, but, but you see that kind of sets the narrative for what then flows. And then here's the conclusion. The United States will bring our tools to bear to vigorously advance LGBT rights. All right. Now, if by that we mean basic human rights, rights to freedom of speech, rights not to be killed for uh, uh, your, your you know, uh, status rather than your conduct, uh, what have you, um, nobody disagrees with that. But watch how this gets implemented uh, as they uh, uh, play this. So here's the substance of the memo. Um, combating criminalization of LGBT status or conduct. See, the opening just talks about status, but we're now we move directly from status to conduct. So agencies engaged abroad are directed to strengthen existing efforts to effectively combat the criminalization of LGBT status or conduct uh, and to expand efforts to combat discrimination, homophobia, and intolerance on the basis of LGBT status or conduct. So it's not status that is the aim of this. It's the conduct. It's the laws criminalizing homosexual conduct that is the target of this memorandum. Protecting vulnerable LGBT refugees and asylum seekers. Uh, this is going to be part of our asylum review, but it's also going to reach into countries of first asylum. So if, if, the, uh, uh, if a refugee comes out of Nigeria or Kenya or Uganda and goes into another country as first asylum, even if their ultimate asylum seeking country is us, we are going to put pressure on that country of first asylum to apply our standards uh, uh, through here as well, according to this memorandum. Section three, foreign assistance to protect human rights and advance non-discrimination. Agencies involved with foreign aid, assistance, and development shall enhance their ongoing efforts um, uh, to ensure regular federal government engagement with government, civil, uh, citizens, civil society, and the private sector in order to build respect for the human rights of LGBT persons. In other words, we're going to shift our foreign aid policies in order to advance this agenda uh, as a matter of executive uh, policy-making judgment rather than any of act of Congress making a policy judgment on this. Uh, and swift and meaningful U.S. responses uh, to abuses uh, the Department of State sets up a standing group uh, to deal with uh, any incidents of that threaten the human rights of LGBT persons abroad. Sounds perfectly fine, except when you see what they mean by that language, what constitutes their version of human rights is not uh, uh, what normally we would think of in seeing that. And agencies engaged abroad should strengthen the work they have begun and initiate additional efforts in these multilateral fora and organizations. So that's the presidential memo and directive. Right. Uh, and here's how it gets implemented. Aid to radical LGBT groups via the new LGBT Global Development Partnership of USAID. Includes uh, Australia Lesbian Foundation for Justice, which advocates for the legalization of prostitution, which it never uses the word prostitution. It calls it sex work. Pro-LGBT requirements now as a condition for partnering with USAID. Uh, that's going to pretty much knock out any faith-based uh, uh, initiative and organizations and participating in the provision of U.S. Develop, uh, aid to development, developing countries. Um, and we get this, uh, the LGBT Vision for Action published by USAID that kind of sets out the agenda. And here's what it says. This vision outlines our agency's commitment, both in Washington and abroad, to include LGB considerations in every area of our work and in every place we work. This is now the sine qua non of USAID. It is going to be the driving force for everything that organization does. All right? Note how radical it is. LGBT persons and their allies can come together to advocate for equal treatment for all persons regardless of sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression. So those things have now gotten into the USAID primary uh, document. In California, we've now seen how that language has made it illegal to deny a teenage boy who claims to be a girl access to the girl's showers. Uh, a federal judge has ordered taxpayers to pay for gender reassignment surgery. Um, uh, this is just the tip of the iceberg, folks. And now we're making this a condition on our U.S. Uh, AID foreign policy aid. Uh, and it's not just that, but their mission is now to transform uh, foreign nations' policy. Here's the language from that LGBT Vision for Action document. USAID seeks to improve the lives of LGBT citizens around the world by becoming more inclusive in our development efforts, by ensuring that LGBT persons have access and reap the benefits of our programming. And in so doing, 
are instrumental in the transformation of their own societies. So we are going to use U.S. aid to transform these societies to come into line with what the Obama administration views on these issues. Um, here's uh, a case study, Uganda's anti-sodomy law. Uh, signed by President Museveni in, uh, in 2014. It, it, contrary to the way it was reported here in the United States, it provided life imprisonment for aggravated homosexuality. That is, homosexual acts committed by somebody infected with HIV AIDS who knew that by conducting that act, they were very likely uh, to give that deadly disease uh, death sentence to, the, the, to their sex partner. And homosexual acts with minors. Uh, and then prison for groups who counsel people into homosexuality. The reaction in Europe, Netherlands, Norway, and Denmark immediately cut or suspended aid payments to Uganda. The World Bank did as well. Uh, the U.S. reaction, President Obama warns that signing the bill will affect relations between U.S. and Uganda. Secretary of State Kerry announces that he has begun an internal review of our relationship with the government of Uganda to ensure that all dimensions of our engagement, including assistance programs, uphold our anti-discrimination policies and principles and reflect our values. That's the very definition of cultural imperialism. We're going to use our aid to impose our values on yours and make you accept and adopt them. In June of 2014, the U.S. announced its sanctions, suspension of some of the aid to Uganda, imposition of visa restrictions, cancellation of regional military exercises, despite the fact that the Ugandan soldiers have been helping U.S. in Somalia and in the fight against the, quote, Lord's Resistance Army, which has massacred, massacred and kidnapped tens of thousands of people in Central Africa. Uh, the, that's the kind of thing we're giving up and throwing to the wind in order to advance this agenda. All right. Um, the Uganda response. President Museveni, we see how you do things. The families, how they're organized. All the things we see them, we keep quiet. It's not our country. Maybe you like it. But so now there's an attempt at social imperialism to impose social values, your social values of one group, on our society in Uganda. That's the very definition of cultural imperialism. He uses the phrase social imperialism. He sees what's going on. Africans do not seek to impose their views on anybody. We do not want anybody to impose their views on us. This very debate has provoked, was provoked by Western groups who come to our schools and try to recruit children into homosexuality. It is better to limit the damage, and here he's talking about risking losing U.S. aid. It is better to limit the damage, rather, than to exacerbate it. Now, the Uganda Supreme Court invalidated the law, but only on technical grounds that there had not been a quorum. I suspect that it's going to come back, and I hope it comes back in short order. Now, there's been pressure at the United Nations as well. In 2004, there was a General Assembly resolution that requires the Secretary General to determine marital status of UN staff by reference to the laws of the country of origin of that staff. Nevertheless, uh, in June of 2014, uh, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon unilaterally extended the benefits of marriage to all UN staff, uh, uh, including same-sex couples, even those whose country of origin did not recognize that as a married relationship, and directly contrary to the 2004 General Assembly resolution. Now, in March of 2015, just two months ago, there was a vote to quash that General Sec Secretary General's order um, by the same General Assembly. Uh, there shouldn't have needed to be a motion to quash because he had no authority to issue it in the first place. It was directly contrary to the governing rule of the General Assembly. Eighty nations voted in favor of quashing, uh, I'm sorry, in favor of same-sex marriage recognition, so voted to uphold the Secretary General's order, even though half of them do not recognize it. There had been an intense pressure on those to vote for it. 43 against. Significantly, 70 nations abstained uh, because of pressure that had been brought against them. Don't cast the vote here. Because if those 70 that abstained, all of them from nations that have laws that do not recognize same-sex marriage, 70 plus the 43 against, there would have been an overwhelming two-to-one margin to, to um, uh, uh, re re repeal or to quash the Secretary General's order. Um, uh, Center for Family and Human Rights says this, the abstentions and the no-shows are the product of a six-year campaign by the United States 
and European countries to get countries to abstain during votes involving lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender rights at the United Nations. And I'll guarantee you, in that six-year campaign, there was a lot of threats of cutting off U.S. and European aid to those nations uh, who desperately need our aid uh, because of the, um, uh, the abject poverty and other problems that those countries are facing. This is extortion. <laughs> And we ought to call it for what it is and highlight it and try and put a stop to it. Now, U.S. aid policy can be reversed. And quite frankly, it already is contrary to law. Here's what the Foreign Assistance Act of 1961, signed by President Kennedy, says. The principal objective of our foreign aid is the encouragement and sustained support of the people of developing countries in their efforts to acquire the knowledge and resources essential to development and to build the economic, political, and social institution which will improve the quality of their lives. It's to alleviate poverty. It's to promote self-sustaining economic growth with equitable distribution of benefits. And it's to encourage development process to protect civil and economic rights and promote good government. That's the kind of mantra for why we have USAID. Where is this money being diverted from that Obama and his administration are using here? Well, it's being diverted from poverty programs which are designed to substantially lower infant mortality, increase life expectancy, food production, literacy, and development. It's being diverted from health programs, which are used to primarily to, for basic integrated health services, safe water and sanitation, disease prevention and control. And the special needs of children and mothers, the so-called Child Survival Fund. These are the funds, the appropriations that are given to USAID, and yet USAID is now saying our primary purpose is to advance LGBT rights and causes in every area of our work and in every place we work. The money's coming from these other sources. Those are the people that are having their money diverted away from them. Contrary to the goal of preventing HIV and AIDS, Section 104A uh, of the foreign aid uh, provisions, assistance to combat HIV and AIDS, it is a major objective of Congress, who passed the law and sets the policy, to provide assistance for the prevention, treatment, and control of HIV AIDS, particularly activities focused on women and youth and to prevent mother-to-child transmission. Prevention, that's what we're supposed to be doing with this money. Funding of programs and efforts that are designed to impart knowledge with the exclusive purpose of, quote, helping individuals avoid behaviors that place them at risk of HIV infection, including reduction of casual sexual partnering. What is the Obama USAID administration doing? Exactly the opposite. Look at why this is so significant. This is a map uh, relatively recently of uh, a global view of HIV infection. Notice uh, how the large percentages of sub-Saharan Africa uh, that are dealing with this epidemic. And yet we're now forcing them to repeal laws that might well help stop uh, this pandemic uh, there. It's unbelievable. It's, it's unconscionable. Um, uh, now, they'll say, well, we have a ban on providing aid to countries that engage in human rights abuse, and therefore a country that has prohibitions on sodomy or same-sex marriage are abusing human rights, and therefore we can't give them our aid unless they come in line. This has been the argument. But look at the actual language of the statute. The kind of human rights abuses that are being talked about is not signing on to the homosexual rights agenda. It's pattern of gross violations of internationally recognized human rights, of which that is not one, including torture or cruel, inhumane, and de degrading treatment, prolonged detention, disappearance, abduction, those kind of things. It's got nothing to do with the homosexual rights fight that is the hook that the Obama administration is using this. No assistance may be provided to any government failing to take appropriate and adequate measures within their means to protect children from exploitation. Remember President Museveni's statement, this very debate was provoked by Western groups who come to our schools and try to recruit children into homosexuality? Are they being exploited to further this agenda and doing it with U.S. aid dollars that are running directly contrary to the purposes set out in the statute by Congress? I believe they are. The Kenya example, what's at stake? The Kenya Constitution provides, it's lovely, we the people of Kenya acknowledging the supremacy of the almighty God of all creation, committed to nurturing and protecting the well-being of the individual, the family, communities, and the nation, exercising our sovereign and inalienable right to determine the form of government or our country. That seems to be a right we don't recognize uh, if they're not in line with our values and our views as determined by the Obama administration. Because of those things, they've adopted their constitution. And what does it provide? Now, it recognizes 
And the aspiration of all Kenyans for a government based on essential values of human rights, equality, freedom, and it's undoubtedly that language that will be argued uh, that pressure from the U.S. and others in the West simply advances this aspirational goal of their own constitution. But that's an aspirational goal in general terms. Here are the specific terms of the Kenyan constitution. The family is the natural and fundamental unit of society and the, nat and the necessary basis of social order and shall enjoy the recognition and protection of the state. Every adult has the right to marry a person of the opposite sex based on the free consent of the parties. And Section 53 of their Constitution, every child has the right to parental care and protection, which includes the equal responsibility of the mother and father to provide for that child. So any notion that that generic aspirational language uh, 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 requires Kenya or other African countries, which have similar provisions in many of them to this, to ignore that basic natural uh, establishment of the family is belied by the much more specific and detailed language elsewhere in the Constitution. So what can you do? Whoop. Yeah, so, so we've got a we've got a foreign affairs committee dealing with Africa. People over there ought to know that this is going on. Let's let them know that it's going on. Request oversight hearings. What's the State Department doing? Identify, let's get the appropriations committees. Identify where the money is being diverted and how much of it. And if you know of examples in your work of U.S. pressure being brought to bear from our State Departments, our consulates, our embassies in Africa, in Muslim nations in the Middle East, in South and Central America, let me know so that I can start building the dossier broader on this. I've gotten some unbelievable documents already of what's going on under the radar. Uh, I'd like to get more. I'd like to help build the case. This is explosive. We're ignoring, uh, this administration is ignoring the statutory authorities for where this money ought to be going and for what purpose it is, and it's redevoting it to things that pursue an entirely, not just different agenda, but an agenda that actually undermines the very purposes for which the money was appropriated. And it seems to me we ought to shed some light on that because the people who are going to suffer from this are those in the most um, uh, uh, underprivileged uh, parts of our world. Uh, when we give money to try and uh, uh, you know, make sure we get malaria out of the water and we divert that money to pursuing an agenda that is you know, uh, hitting the tip of the iceberg only in first world countries where we seem to be aggressively concerned with this, we're depriving kids of that basic sanitary uh, uh, situation in their home countries. We're undermining the very purposes we have that foreign aid in the first place. And we ought to be screaming that this is going on from the rooftops in order to try and put a stop to it. Uh, not just because it's the right thing to do, but we are not an imperialistic country. We have never been, and we ought not to tolerate those that would make it an imperialistic country, particularly on grounds that are going to unravel and undermine basic core principles. Thanks very much. <laughs> Question, do we have time for questions? Yep, all right. Questions? Yes, sir. Thank you, Dr. Eastman. Uh, Peter Sprague with Family Research Council. Um, I wanted to ask you, talking about the specific examples, uh, I'm, I'm curious about whether there may not be a bit of hypocrisy in the uh, administration's application of this policy. Are you aware of any examples where they have brought pressure to bear on Muslim countries because of their human rights ab abuses of LGBT persons? I'm, I, I'm not aware. I, su I suspect that they would get um, less, they would have less progress <laughs> uh, th there than otherwise. Uh, it, it is a very interesting anomaly, though, in the, in the development. Uh, you know, I don't know. One of the one of the things we're learning is that um, uh, th they're trying to uh, influence by by use of this money uh, what the UN delegations are doing. And I think if we really uh, unpeel the layer, the onion layers on that vote in the UN, and see what kind of pressure was brought to bear to get either uh, yes votes or to get abstentions, um, uh, I think we're going to find a lot of that kind of pressure. And and there are a number of Muslim countries in that group as well. So I'd be very curious to find out why some of those countries voted to abstain and what kind of pressure was brought to bear on them. Yes, sir. Um, Al Milliken, uh, AM Media. Uh, do you see a connection uh, with what's happening with the governments that you're pointing out as to what was happening in recent years with uh, Episcopal and Anglican churches in particular worldwide? 
Yeah, I do. Look, uh, uh, I was heavily involved in um, uh, well, some of the property disputes over the Episcopal Church and the breakaway. And, and the breakaway uh, churches in America were realigning themselves with the Anglican communion of some of the African uh, Anglican uh, communion in order to adhere to more biblically based uh, 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 doctrine. Um, and so I think it's no accident that those same countries that uh, in, in which the, um, the more conservative Anglican communion exists are also the countries that are falling uh, under the watchful eye of our U.S. aid policies and pressure. Yes. Uh, hi, I'm Andrew Herod. I'm an independent researcher and writer. I was just curious, what sort of arguments do they present uh, for advocating these policies, say, in U.S. aid in terms of, I mean, are there transgendered farmers in Kenya or something? They're, they're try <laughs> well, apparently not, but they want them to be. Uh, you know, uh, uh, no. Look, um, the, the 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 if you look at that vision document, it's it's really stark. Uh, you know, I mean, they're hiding they're hiding a lot of this stuff. But but you know, once you find out where their documents are, they're, at the end of the day, they're not hiding it. It's right there if we take the time to read it. Um, and the connection is uh, they've made the claim unsuccessful in any of the internet national organizations yet, uh, that, that not having criminal uh, prohibitions on homosexual sodomy is a fundamental human right. Uh, and, and therefore, they're taking the language in our USA documents that, that we use our aid to advance fundamental human rights, as well as to alleviate poverty and prevent AIDS and what have you. And, and because that's so important to this administration that they're putting, they're putting all of their efforts in every place we work and everything we do in advancing that. But the initial assumption that this is a fundamental right recognized internationally is false. And so they have, they have built uh, an edifice of this entire program and the reshifting of American priorities on a false premise of what constitutes a fundamental human right. You don't have a fundamental human right to engage in sodomy because most nations still criminalize the conduct, and yet they're using that hook to force USA to pressure them to repeal uh, those initiatives. And leaving by the wayside the very things that the, that the foreign aid was designed to support, which is the alleviation of poverty. And, I mean, we're talking... Uh, you know, in, in, in Kenya, we, we drove by the, one of the largest slums in the world. The day before I got there, there were floods, the uh, excessive rains, and 12 people whose houses were built a little too close to the river were washed away and are gone, all right, because, you know, they don't have enough money to deal with the slum problem there. And now we're redirecting that aid that is designed to help them confront those kind of problems. We're redirecting it to advance LGBT agendas. It's preposterous. Uh, and yet this is what this administration, I mean, they're doubling down on it. This is, this is the priority. Every single organization that, if, it, it, that uh, it becomes a party and uh, uh, implementing U.S. aid policy has to sign on to these initiatives or they don't get the contracts. They don't get to be part of it. Uh, and, and, and everything is being steered away from the reason that aid was written to, this, to advancing this agenda. Uh, Kathy Roos, Family Research Council. How and a former Lincoln Fellow yeah, as well. Yeah. Thank you. Nice yeah. to meet you. Uh, isn't this really becoming a religious test? I mean, if you, I'm Catholic, and if I run an organization that provides services, then I'm disqualified because I'm a Catholic. If I'm a pr predominantly Catholic country, then I'm disqualified from USAID because I'm Catholic. You know, and so I don't, I don't get to partner with the U.S. I don't get to receive benefits from the U.S., because I'm Catholic. Right. Well, right. It, uh, of course, if you, if you adhere to um, common sense views about sexuality without any religious basis, you're getting excluded from it as well. So it's not exclusively religious. But, but you're right. The countries and the organizations that we find that are going to be on the losing end of these new policies are going to be those uh, quite often that adhere to those policies, in part because they're great, rooted in nature. There's our Lincoln scholarship training coming up. Uh, but, but in part because they're parallel rooted in, in religious faith. And, and, and so, yeah, I mean, it's uh, uh, most of the faith-based organizations that do this kind of charity work are going to be excluded from the opportunity of being able to be in the forefront of this kind of work with that aid funding, U.S. aid funding, because, uh, or, or give up their views. And, and th you know, we, we call that in, in other areas of the law an unconstitutional condition, but it is driving the wedge on this agenda. This agenda uh, is, is now substituting for any other goal uh, over at USAID. Um, and you think about, 
you know, maybe it's the most important issue in the United States or in a sliver of the United States occupied, you know, over at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue up to Madison Avenue, New York or something. But it's not the most pressing issue in most of the world. You know, saving those people from malaria because they're living too close to an unsanitized river is a whole lot more pressing uh, than, than transgendered re sex reassignment surgeries or what have you. And yet this is what's driving it. I, I can see why the African countries are getting upset. You know, I got, I got people starving, and you're telling me I got to deal with this? You know, let's, let's uh, kind of keep our priorities straight here. This administration is insisting that we shift those priorities. Dr. Eastman, in, in your comments and in, in the announcement we made of your lecture, you alluded to the fact that the president is right at the verge of, or in fact perhaps is already overstepping his executive authority. Two questions. Can you explain that a little more fully? And if what he's doing now is under the auspices of an executive order or a directive to an agency. Could a subsequent administration simply by executive action change it? Yeah. Uh, the reason I think he's exceeded his authority is because, and it's technical, and I'm not nearly the expert on our U.S. foreign uh, aid statutory authorities than, than others in the room might be, but, but um, uh, by my read of those statutory authorities, uh, th those fundings are designed to further certain purposes. Alleviation of poverty, prevention of AIDS are two of the biggest purposes right now. Uh, and when I'm not doing that with that appropriation, then I'm expending monies on something that is not authorized. Uh, when I'm doing it on the AIDS thing, then I'm forcing those countries to take steps that actually um, exacerbate the AIDS problem rather than uh, preventing it. I am acting not just to the side of the statutory authority, I am acting at direct odds and contrary to that statutory authority. So that's the basis of that. But it, you're right, it is all done by, it's not even executive order. The presidential memorandum of December 2011, I think may have been an executive order, but mostly it's that broad language in those presidential directives that are then being implemented not even with regulations, but just with, you know, policy memos. Like that, the vision is just a policy memo. It wasn't a regulation that went through APA notice and comment. So the next president can immediately repeal it and say that's, you know, we're going to get back to actually following what the statute says we ought to be doing. Uh, and, uh, and, and I hope, you know, some say, well, there's been so much gone on over the last eight years, it would be impossible to repeal everything. It's just one, just one executive order on, that takes effect at 12.01 on January 20th would just be everything issued uh, by the executive since January 20th, 2009, is hereby repealed pending further review. That would do it. <laughs> yes. Hi, um, Joe Egelhoff, Wisconsin Family Action, and um, long ago MBA Claremont Graduate School. Good, thanks. Um, Peter Drucker. Yes, indeed. I lived in Peter's house for many really? years. Yeah. I took two classes from him, yes. Um, I'm wondering if any government or government agency or foundation has actually withdrawn funds, withheld funds, um, due to, uh, so far, due to a country's uh, LGBT policies. Yeah, so uh, the, the Nigeria, no, the Ugandan example, uh, we cut off funds, not all of them, but a good number of them, to Uganda in June of 2014. Uh, and then several European countries and the World Bank did as well. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Like I said, I, this was... This was completely unknown to me uh, as of six weeks ago, so I'm just I'm just at the at the beginning of looking at what's going on and what I'm finding is eye opening. Yes. Um, Al Milliken again. Uh, I was curious if you know in the countries you were studying what the rules and restrictions are for blood donations because uh, just this Saturday I donated blood and like one question was which I, if I understood, if I had act, um, answered positively, it would have been not allowed to donate, like if you've ha uh, ever, ever had sexual contact with another male, if you're a male. Uh, but now we're, we just announced that we're repealing that prohibition. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, my understanding, yeah. The, because the, because, as, like the, if you abstain for because a, as the risk changed? No, the politics have changed. And it, <laughs> in the African countries, do you know what the blood donation rules are? I, I, don't, I don't know. Um, but 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 given given how uh, principled and hard line they are on the conduct itself, I'd be surprised if they didn't have such rules in place. But I just don't know. 
Uh, Dr. Eastman, my name is Mario Diaz with CWA. Uh, to what extent do you uh, think this draws power from Supreme Court decision? I, I think this, you know, since the Lawrence decision, this has kind of brought the movement in government uh, to move in this direction. Then we have Windsor, and then if this uh, next decision goes the wrong way, it seems that it would... Uh, it could go from the conduct then into same-sex marriage, which I believe I didn't see that as much in your talk today. Yeah, no, I, I, I do think uh, that it's driven. Look, uh, the, the courts have signed on to an agenda. Justice Scalia talked about it all the way back in Romer versus Evans. The court has confused uh, a culture war with a, a, a fit of peak or a culture comp, right? Uh, uh, but the courts have signed off onto this agenda in the United States. What Obama administration do and is now taking that agenda and using our power through our aid to force others to sign on to it as well. I do think there's a direct correlation. And by the way, let me go back to um, uh, uh, what, what the Ugandan president said about this. Sorry, it's way back. Uh, no, uh, was it Ni or Nigeria? Was it Nigeria? No, no. So he says he says. Uh, you know, we see these things going on in your country. You know, uh, we think it's crazy. I mean, he's, he's a little bit more diplomatic. He says, we think it's crazy. You know, we, think, we keep quiet. It's not our country. Maybe you like that direction you're going. Maybe you like the, the, the risk you're placing yourselves at, the harms that are going to flow. Um, but, but don't try and impose that on us. Just because we've got more common sense on these things than you do doesn't mean, right? I mean, that's what he's saying in that statement. Uh, and I do think it's a direct outgrowth of, of those prior decisions. And, and hopefully my cautious optimism on the direction of the Supreme Court decision in June proves right, but if it proves wrong, it'll be the kind of nail in the coffin of that. Um, and, and there will be an intense pressure on African countries as a result of this foreign aid to come into line with the new model that we have just had handed down from on high over at 1 First Street. Okay. Hello, um, Chris Kasich, Family Research Council here. Uh, isn't the Obama administration essentially trying to do the same thing to us domestically now? I mean, we're, we're seeing about OSHA orders, about transgenderism. I mean, where does this come from? This, uh, you know, you know, well, that's right. all of this into Title VII and yep. uh, EEOC rules. And I mean, it's just all of this stuff is, is going on all over the place. Change right? the laws. We don't need to change those things in laws. I can right. do it with a grant recipients order. I have and a pen, uh, contractors. I have a phone. Well, look, look, uh, and, and they started immediately uh, after the Windsor decision. The Windsor decision is grounded on federalism. It says if a state adopts a new version of marriage, it's the obligation of the federal government to take it as it comes from the states. Well, that means for those states that didn't adopt the new version of marriage, the federal government ought to take it from those states to what their understanding is. And what did the Obama administration do immediately after Windsor? It mandated that, that anybody from a state that recognized same-sex marriage, that moved into a state that didn't, had to receive federal benefits in line with their marital status from the prior state, not in line with the state in which they were now resident. Right, which was directly contrary to that language, that federalism foundation for Justice Kennedy's opinion in Windsor, and they did that just by executive fiat. Uh, and then, and and this goes back, um, you know, the the change in the administration's language in the briefs from some of those early same-sex marriage cases, driven by then Solicitor General Elena Kagan, now deciding vote on the Supreme Court Justice Elena Kagan, uh, was exactly the same thing. Uh, you know, they, they, they manipulated the law and the language in order to achieve that outcome, and then now they are broadly uh, implementing it using the the tools of the executive branch illicitly in my view to do it and it's not this isn't it's, it's not unique to this area they're doing it on practically every area they operate on we're seeing it happen on the immigration orders we're seeing it happen in a number of contexts and this one it's pernicious because the law no longer matters the Constitution's Article I, the lawmaking power is vested in a Congress of the United States no longer matters the basic policy judgments no longer matter uh, that, that, you know, where we have assigned to the, the authority to make those basic policy judgments. There's no claim here that what's doing is simply filling in holes on some delegated authority that Congress has given. They are completely rewriting the policies, uh, not just, like I said earlier, not just, you know, operating 
to the side of the policies that were adopted, but actually taking steps that undermine the policies that were adopted by the elected representatives of the American people. So it's much broader than the fight over marriage or homosexual rights. It is a fight over who, who has the authority to decide our policy making in the country. It's a basic fight over constitutionalism. And they are threatening it on every front that I can see. We have time for one more question. Yes, sir. So this will be the last question. All right, my name is Jack Clank. I have some involvement with Uganda, so your comments about Uganda are very uh, interesting to me. Um, um, I don't know whether Americans understand how profoundly offensive it is to Africans to have these kinds of pressures uh, brought upon them. Um, uh, not just religious Africans, but all Africans, but in particular religious Africans. And the uh, religious organizations such as the Anglican Church, the Catholic Church, other Christian groups are united in their resentment against this kind of imperialism, not only from the U.S. government, but from religious organizations in the West, such as the Episcopal Church, which have uh, attempted to impose this agenda. Um, by coincidence, today is Uganda Martyrs Day which is a national holiday in Uganda. Uh, the young men who were martyred in the 1880s uh, are celebrated by Catholic and Anglican groups around the world. Um, these martyrs were killed in the 1880s as a result of their unwillingness to give in to the demands of the king of Buganda, who not only wanted them to renounce their faith, but wanted them to engage in homosexual activities. So the offense is very, very great. And I think that um, Americans need to understand this, and I appreciate your comments. Well, thank you. And, and I'll close with it because I, I think it's a very good uh, uh, day of commemoration of memory to, to close the note on. Um, uh, the Obama administration is not using our foreign aid to put pressure on African countries to deal with the slaughter of Christians uh, that we see happening. It's, use it, it, it's using it to take steps to actually, that it actually further encourages that kind of conduct. And it's directly contrary not just to our own policy as adopted by Congress, which is the policy maker, but it's, um, uh, but it's contrary to, to true basic human rights. And, and it's a shame that we have let our government get to the point where we are imperialistically imposing not just our policy, but bad policy to boot. And I think that's what we see going on here. Thank you all very much for your attention.